Um, I studied at Northwestern. Uh, I went to Northern Illinois as an undergraduate, and then I studied with Sterling Stuckey at Northwestern, um, great African-American historian and black freedom movement um, activist who wrote a book called Slave Culture. And slave culture is important for many reasons. It actually comes up very close to our time and has essays on Robeson and Du Bois in it. But the first hundred pages or so are Sterling's reflections uh, on how what he calls the real melting pot, the only real melting pot in U.S. history. And what he's talking about is the way that um, hundreds of African ethnicities were grouped together by slavery, put together on slave ships, which Sterling called the incubators of Pan-Africanism. Um, so that Pan-Africanism becomes not uh, just a movement or mainly a movement by intellectuals and middle class people and you know but it becomes actually the experience of the slaves and so what's important I think about that book is that it lets us see it's titled slave culture because it wants to say that black nationalism at its best and pan-africanism at its best actually was a reflection not just of people sitting in universities and thinking about this or that uh, or theorizing, but it actually describes an experience. And it's a very, very liberating thing to think about, uh, uh, to, to think about um, all of the different ways that people had to make an African people. Uh, and to talk about teaching, uh, one of the ways that Sterling brilliantly got this across is, is uh, James Weldon Johnson's uh, little, I don't even know what you'd call it, 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 it's called God's Trombones, but it's kind of between a chant and a play and a performance. But this work that James Weldon Johnson did, there's a moment in it where a slave baby dies and uh, then the funeral has to be preached. and Sterling says at that point, okay, who's going to stand up and preach that, that funeral and say it's 1710 in Virginia or in uh, Maryland? Who's going to actually stand up and preach that funeral? Is it going to be a Yorban funeral? Is it going to be an Ewe funeral? What kind of funeral is it, is it going to be? And, and what kind of genius would it take on the part of the preacher to say things that are going to be meaningful to the group that he represents, to the group that suffered the loss, to the family that suffered the loss, but that also doesn't just descend into being the funeral of one ethnic group or another. In other words, how do you get to, Af to Pan-African in reality? Not just in books, but in, in reality, how did people actually create a, a, a Pan-African culture? Because it actually, you know, there, there weren't Africans in Africa in 1710. There were people who happened to come from the continent of Africa, but they, were of, they thought that they were more different, one group from another, than they were the same. And it took, actually, this experience of capitalism, slavery, in the modern world to make it possible for people to think in terms of these broader unities. So to me, the, the really memorable things, and I'm just going to talk and I'll open it to questions in a minute, but uh, the really memorable things to me in terms of seeing how Pan-African history is taught at its, at its best are dramatic situations, are human situations where people are really having to be creative and to figure and to figure things out and it also means if you think about those dramas uh, it, it means that the history of slavery wasn't only loss it was also creativity and uh, durability of a, of a people becoming a people that it's there's actually this process in which people were made to give up a lot, to give up languages, for example, to give up drums in, in most cases in the U.S. South, 
but then how within those constraints did people say, yeah, but also we're going to become something else and we're going to uh, meld together a hundred different cultures into what you wonder why within the US context, African American culture is so overwhelmingly the most culturally creative element of US culture. Well, Sterling would say this history, this dramatic history is a history of learning how to incorporate all different groups of, of people under tremendous, tremendous strain and therefore we have to deal with that drama. So the only, the only tip that I'd have about teaching about Pan-Africanism is that the, the teaching ought to be dramatic. The, the best book ever written in the United States in history yet is W.E.B. Du Bois' Black Reconstruction from 1935. And at the very end of that book, Du Bois has a chapter called The Propaganda of History, 700 page book, 30 page final chapter called The Propaganda of History. And he just totally takes apart every white supremacist historian that had written before his time and he shows how wrong they are, what they ignore, what they lie about, what, uh, what, what sources they just don't credit at all. And so he shows they're wrong. And he, he keeps using the word science, the science of history with a capital S and says these people aren't scientists. But then at the very, very end of that chapter, in the very end of this long book, uh, he says, why are they, what's the worst thing about these histories? And he says, the worst thing about the way that Americans write history where race is concerned is that they are so wrong that they miss, and Du Bois says, the most magnificent drama in the last several thousand years. And so he's not just talking about telling a story or a narrative or the facts or science. He says, this was a drama. He says, it was a tragedy that beggared the Greek. The history of slavery and emancipation in the United States was a tragedy, and then the betrayal of emancipation was a tragedy that beggared Greek uh, tragedies. So, you know, if, if we end up, and I think one of the things that's so cool about the way that, that uh, you and your students are inspiring each other down, down here is that there really should be some excitement around it. it. It really shouldn't be narrow and factual and it ought to be a history that's a dramatic uh, history because it, it involves actually the creation of something new and the creation of something new that then goes back to Africa. And if they, if that story you told about Nkrumah saying I'm, I'm taking this back to Africa. One of the things that he was taking back to Africa was Pan-Africanism. It was this sense that there are African peoples that sometimes in the context of contentious African histories, it wasn't so easy to see that from the African vantage point. But you know that experience in the new world is what actually creates Pan-Africanism on the ground among slaves. And then we know that it can happen because it already happened in that, uh, in that situation. So.